É um prazer, um motivo de alegria, uma grande honra ter conosco o professor Craig Calhoun. Ele é um sociólogo norte-americano, muito conhecido entre nós, embora não tenha ainda nenhum livro traduzido para o português, mas ele habita as melhores referências bibliográficas dos estudos mais especializados que temos produzido. Ele é um professor da New York University, presidente do Social Science Research Council e tem participado como professor visitante de várias universidades em várias partes do mundo. Já esteve na China, França, Sudão, Noruega, entre outros países. Temos a pretensão de um dia trazê-lo para ser professor visitante do Brasil também. Ele lida com áreas de interesse e problemas relacionados à globalização, à internacionalização contemporânea, tais como cosmopolitismo, cultura e comunicação, humanitarismo, movimentos sociais, impacto das mudanças tecnológicas, educação, religião, enfim, temas que dizem respeito à agenda contemporânea. Nós temos a alegria de saudá-lo, dizer que a Unbox é, se sente muito grata pela sua presença no Brasil e o trabalho que ele hoje vai expor tem como título Cosmopolitismo e Nacionalismo. Agradeço a presença de todos e vamos passar a palavra ao professor Craig. Well, thank you very much for that, Ria. I'm very grateful for the introduction and I'm grateful for the chance to be with you at Unbox. I'm going to stand in front of my own speech. What I want to do very briefly today is to suggest that we, in social science and to some extent in the world beyond social science, have made a very strong opposition between ideas of cosmopolitanism and nationalism and that the opposition is not very helpful, but in fact gets in the way of better thinking. This is something that is perhaps particularly true in some fields and in different ways in different of our social science disciplines. Political science and sociology have each been constructed in much closer relationship, much more dependence on the idea of the nation state, which is in the background, the main sort of idea of society and sociology, which is central to the kind of politics that have been of most concern to political scientists. Anthropologists have been much more concerned with other scales of phenomena than the national, and yet also are implicated in many ways in these sorts of debates about the nature of cosmopolitanism, the nature of internationalization, the nature of relations among different peoples of the world, even what counts uh, as a people, what counts as a culture and cultural difference. Now, part of what is in the background to this is that the state in much of the world has gone out of fashion, not everywhere, out of fashion among social scientists who for a generation have been talking about the problems of relying on the state, that it's a difficulty, as Charles Tilley once put it, that the idea that society fits the nation state is a pernicious postulate. So we have a widespread notion that state is not the only correct unit of analysis and needs to be challenged. But also among activists in civil society and a variety of social movements, there is also a great deal of skepticism about the state, and it's certainly among capitalists. And it's an irony that the people who are promoting a kind of market-driven vision of globalization and people who are resisting it are united in their skepticism about states. There are not many things about which the corporate power elite meeting in Davos and the global anti-corporate globalization movement symbolized by Porto Alegre agree. They agree on very little but they each tend to be skeptical of, even hostile toward, states. And this is, I think, a source of some difficulty. 
It is a kind of convergence of left-wing and right-wing different visions of what freedom would mean, an anti-authoritarian <laughs> romantic vision on one side, a liberal market vision on the other. It's also, in more specifically social science terms, due to the fact that modernization theory in many ways collapsed. It entered a crisis in the 1960s. This became a terminal crisis in the 1970s, but there was no replacement. The old kind of modernization theory that was supported by the idea of British and American industrialization and the social changes, progress, and growth of these countries, and the notion that this would be identified with the modern and extended everywhere else in the world as a single path of development was very widely attacked and very largely discredited by the 1970s. And yet it was not really succeeded. It's not as though social science found a new kind of consensus paradigm after the collapse of modernization theory. It wasn't Marxism. It wasn't Weberian comparative sociology. It wasn't any particular new agreement about what were the categories of social science and what was the big picture. We did not all become followers of André Gunderfrank. We did not all become followers of Emmanuel Wallerstein. There were a variety of contending visions, and much of social science after the 1970s turned away from a focus on large-scale historical change, away from the questions that had been raised about what were the directions of world development towards studying a variety of phenomena inside nation-states. One of the effects of this is to leave a space for a kind of hidden return of modernization theory. Modernization theory without the words. And I will suggest that much cosmopolitan thinking began to embody that. It began to become the hidden replacement for the idea of modernization. The cosmopolitan was modern. The cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism marked progress. This was the <coughs> path of the future in society. And this is also shaped by the 1970s crisis. I don't have time to go much more into this, but the widespread crises in the 1970s, economic crises with the collapse of exchange rate agreements in Bretton Woods, the OPEC oil agreements, the end of the Vietnam War with its embarrassment for the United States, but also the end of a variety of post-colonial movements and the end of a long post-war boom what in France is called Les Trente Glorieuses, which by coming to an end in various ways, mark a sort of end of an epic, an epic when it seemed natural to speak of progress and modernization to a greater extent, but an epic which was also marked by growth mainly in material productive capacities. After the 1970s, in the rich countries of the world, there was an enormous shift towards finance, as the main mechanism for securing profit and increasing capital. This isn't to talk about the rise of financial capitalism again, but there is a connection, because this helped to drive the particular form of globalization in which, as money moved around the world very rapidly, with various effects, so too there was an imagination of the world as effectively integrated and globalized through that resource. Civil society came into fashion. This was a fashion that was multiplied by the role of popular resistance in civil society organizations uh, in the transformation of Eastern Europe and Soviet communism after 1989, the collapse of 1992. But this was also something that was already being promoted in many ways in the rich countries of the West non-governmental organizations, non-profit organizations of various kinds, a whole agenda of civil society came to the forefront. We might want to ask, in a conference of social scientists, how civil society began to get its special sort of designation of promise. I won't go into it very far, but it's interesting to contemplate. I once heard Agnes Heller, the great Hungarian sociologist, theorist, one of the leaders of the movement, um, to study civil society and saying, I wish we had never used the words. People forget it just means society. 
And there's some truth to this. Part of the origins of thinking about civil society was to think about the extent to which society could be self-organizing, the extent to which it did not require explicit exercise of power from above to organize social relations. There are questions about how complete this can be, and there are different meanings to the term, but there is a long history in which much of what is studied by social scientists is in fact the study of civil society. But in the 1980s and 90s, the phrase civil society began to be captured for a much, much narrower range of analytic problems. The problems of NGOs and nonprofit organizations, of what was sometimes called the voluntary sector, the independent sector, so there was a changing meaning of civil society that narrowed it to a particular set of organizations and activities which did indeed become newly prominent in various ways. The US President George Bush announced a variety of programs to support civil society, saying this amounted to a thousand points of light in the society as a whole. All of these nonprofit organizations doing various sorts of work. He began and his son continued the idea of trying to have partnerships between the government and especially faith-based and religious nonprofit organizations which would carry out various sorts of welfare functions. And this has to do in part with the extent to which that dominant agenda of civil society began to work for various state leaders because it suggested that they would not have to bear the whole responsibility for carrying society. Now, when I say it, the idea of civil society became narrowed to these organizations outside government, we might recall that for thinkers like Adam Smith um, and for much of the early uh, Enlightenment era focus on civil society, the market was part of civil society. That is, business organizations, market organizations were working outside the state. In fact, for Adam Smith, part of his point in writing about the uh, market in the way he did in The Wealth of Nations, describing the invisible hand that guided the market, was to suggest that the market was a demonstration of the capacity of ordinary citizens to organize their transactions and relations with each other without the government, and this could be extended in other areas. But there are three main strands I want to suggest in thinking about civil society. One of them continues to be a market-oriented idea that, there is, that society is self-organizing mainly through markets. So the primary opposition is markets to governments. Is society organized by power or by action in markets? A second idea is the one focused on voluntary organizations, NGOs, as Carlos Forment has recently written focusing on Mexico and Peru, the first volume of the larger study of Latin America. This can be very much contained within a religious mode of organization, or it can be very secular, a separate question. But voluntary organizations underwrite one notion of how people organize. Alexis de Tocqueville wrote about this at great length in his account of democracy in America. But a third notion of civil society, hidden in that notion of the uh, transformations after 1989 in Eastern Europe is of society influencing the state. This is the notion that appears in the idea of the public sphere put forward by Jürgen Habermas and Hannah Arendt and a variety of other things. <laughs> that civil society includes people organized in their everyday relations who are able to collectively have voice to influence the state and potentially to transform the conditions under which they live. If we narrow civil society too much, we miss the account of the interaction among the different ways in which self-organization happens, and we miss the different visions of freedom that are implicit in these. The idea of individual choice, which underpins the notion of the market as freedom. It's an ambiguous. I'm reporting on an ideology. I'm not reporting on a truth, just to be clear. Right? That is, much of the thinking about freedom in markets ignores the power of capital, the power of large corporations, the 
huge asymmetries that structure markets. It is based on an ideology of individual freedom. There is an ideology of autonomous collective action identified with freedom in the vision of the voluntary association. Independent organizations that may not only work to challenge the state, but may simply organize activities in ordinary areas of society. And there is an idea, an identification of freedom with the potential transformation of social institutions, something common to the Marxist tradition, but also to a variety of others. An idea of freedom as essentially collective and essentially embedded in transforming the conditions of life, not just opting out of them in various ways. Now, my point to bringing this up at the beginning of this talk is to stress that if we don't pay attention to all of these, we tend to be too easily ideologically drawn into th thinking in terms of just one of them. Or more specifically, that cosmopolitan discourse, this prominent discourse about the nature of governance and social relations in an era of globalization, becomes distorted by relying on only one of these and missing the contention. For example, George Bush and the idea of a thousand points of light was very much tied to a hollowing out of government, to a reduction in the role of government in providing services. This is something that is visible in important ways in the United States, where there has been since the 1970s a dramatic reduction in the government funding of higher education that is made for crises like that at universities like Berkeley today, but also in a whole series of areas without any crises, an outsourcing of government, an externalization of the performance of government functions. So in the United States today, the government uh, pays for private contractors to run many so-called public schools. Some of them on a profit basis, some of them as nonprofit organizations. The government pays for private contractors to run federal prisons, almost entirely on a for-profit basis. The government pays for private contractors to run immigrant detention centers, so that part of the story of the U.S. anti-immigration policies and the large-scale use of the state's authority to detain people, even without any criminal charge being brought against them, is administered through government contracts to for-profit private firms, and this continues with the military. The war in Iraq marks the first time ever that the United States relied largely on mercenaries for its war. The American War of Independence in the 18th century was fought by American citizen soldiers, militias, against a largely mercenary army deployed by the British monarchy. It had long been one of the guiding ideas of American Republican thought, I don't mean the Republican Party, but the political idea of the Republic, that America did not rely on mercenaries that America was, when it had to resort to arms, dependent on its citizens. It mobilized its people. But in fact, in this current case, among the many other issues with the Iraq War, it marks a large-scale use of contractors, famously Blackwater and Sea Corporations, that have been formed to carry out military services. The war in Afghanistan relies even more on contractors supplementing actual American soldiers with hired mercenaries who are operating in so-called private security companies. This is a big issue about the war, it's an issue about social justice, but also it's an issue about transformation in the idea of the government and its relationship to the people, an idea away from classical republicanism and an idea away from a notion of a mobilized citizenry. Well, other versions of these sorts of cuts and issues are at stake. The current uh, cuts just announced last week in Great Britain, the massive uh, reduction in public center spending, is a, uh, another example, an extreme example. But it shouldn't be thought that this is only something having to do with the world's historically rich countries. It's something that has been tried out in many ways in less developed countries. So countries like Brazil and China and other um, countries um, that are rapidly developing now, 
right, have weathered the current crisis without similar cuts. But 30 years ago, when the World Bank began to promote the idea of structural adjustment, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were engaged in suggesting that macroeconomic balances were crucial to development, and states in the developing world, post-colonial states included, had to cut their funding. This became an argument against the funding of antiretroviral drugs for people suffering from HIV AIDS, for example. The government should not take on this fiscal responsibility. The worldwide debt crisis today is in part an echo of a debt crisis focused on third world governments 20 and 30 years ago. As many of these ideas, which are associated with neoliberalism, were tried out and developed in places like Chile, and now are tried out and implemented in places like the United States, in many ways. Neoliberals have to do with ideological, political neoliberalism. People who are simply developing models, who are not thinking about politics, are incorporating assumptions that have been shaped by a shift in the very categories of thinking that has been associated with neoliberalism and its particular ideas about property rights and about markets. The extent to which markets ideally work smoothly and in an egalitarian fashion to solve problems, markets that are called free because the, the notion of unfreedom is associated entirely with government regulation, not with inequality or corporations. Property rights that are understood as private property. So the phrase private property is easily used to refer to the property of the Microsoft Corporation. And it's not just um, important to see that it's a corporation, that the sense in which it's private is very different from the sense in which individuals enjoy privacy in their lives. Right? It's collectively organized on a very large scale. But it's also property that has pioneered a worldwide movement to extend the idea of private property rights into intellectual property and into property and all kinds of things, indigenous people's knowledge of the plants in their environment, for example, is increasingly privatized as property. So there's been a very large scale privatization, reconstruction of what had been public goods, openly accessible goods as private property, and an organization of markets.